It's the Starlight from 1985's Odin Photon Sailor Starlight. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what? No way is that the worst ever. This thing looks sweet as hell. There's way worse out there. Maybe you think the grappler armed ships in Outlaw Star look goofy. You might be thinking, what of the flying caskets in Legend of the Galactic Heroes? Maybe if you're some kind of heartless monster, you don't like a spaceship that's actually some kind of alien rabbit. But I assure you, based on a variety of different factors, this thing is simply the worst. Let's start with ostensibly the ship's strongest aspect, its visuals. It's cool, very shiny. I'm sure tons of Gen Xers wanted it painted on the sides of their vans. Yet the design is utterly inconsistent to an absurd level. Just look at these shots. This is the same ship. So is this. And this. Ridiculous. It's hurting my head. To my tremendous joy, I discovered that somebody recently posted a restored scan of the technical cutaway diagram included in the Laserdisc version. I'm dangerously close to printing it and putting it on my wall. Massive props to these people for getting this out there. In this diagram, everything fits. The technology doesn't make a lick of sense, of course, but everything actually fits. You better believe I'll be referring back to this diagram later. There are a few times when it manages to stay on model in the actual movie, though, mainly because they reuse the same animation cell over and over. But this is all just the tip of the iceberg. The two main issues here are that the technologies the ship uses are flat-out farcical, and that the entire crew are blisteringly incompetent yahoos. I think the most straightforward way to go through both of these points would just be to discuss what happens in their maiden voyage, noting the technologies as we go. To set the stage a bit, it's the turn of the 22nd century, and humanity has entered an age of laser sailing, using station-based lasers as highways to crisscross the solar system. Believe it or not, this is, as best as I can tell, a technology that is theoretically plausible. Though you really have to feel bad for the passengers in the window seats. But Odin, Photon Sailor Starlight, isn't about the peaceful transit of any of these vessels across the solar system. It's about the titular Starlight, a tremendously expensive prototype vessel with an experimental gravity drive. Now, if you've experienced a good bit of science fiction, this might be ringing some alarm bells, but surprisingly, as you'll see, this isn't the inciting incident they went with. I'll talk through the, frankly, bizarre engine technology in a minute here. First, we need to meet the Starlight's crew. Seen here, Disco running through the impossible corridors of their new vessel. A crew of youngsters, fresh from the academy, led by a few seasoned officers. Somehow able to operate the ship's many control consoles despite the countless cornea-destroying lights. I'll be real though, as a kid, I couldn't get enough of this stuff. I had Odin on VHS back in the day, and I played it so much to flat fill off the tape. Though for all I know, that might have just been the build quality. Regardless, I'll spare you some of the more egregiously blinding parts. There's some flashing in here that makes me wonder if the only thing that prevented it from causing an electric soldier Porygon-style seizure incident is the fact that nobody saw this. Anyway, like I said earlier, the crew are buck wild. Hilariously insubordinate in many dangerous ways we'll see later on. Our introduction to one of them is when he sits on the captain's chair, daydreaming of his own command. Not a terribly out-of-place moment in this kind of naval story, but it's quite the portent of things to come. The bosun violently reprimands him. <laughs> the captain gives the order to set sail, so they make preparations for launch, tapping controls and throwing comically large switches. The vessel departs using thrusters, arguably the ship's most conventional means of propulsion. After clearing the starbase, they unfurl the sails and get ready to enter the laser network. As they do this, the guy who I'm pretty sure is the first officer, though I wasn't able to beat Obra Dinn without a guide, so what do I know, calls on one of the bridge crew and deputizes him into being the communications officer, asking him to communicate with the laser network controllers. He is shocked by this. I'm shocked by this too because this seems to indicate that this important position was not decided on before the journey began. Presumably, this also means that he was not in any meaningful way trained for this. While the regular crew of the ship may have their issues, the officers make some profoundly strange choices too. Anyhow, the laser highway is activated and they begin laser route sailing. 
A tremendous red filter is applied to the ship, and it departs for the moon. Shortly thereafter, they receive an SOS signal that starts the plot in earnest. It's worth pointing out that Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan came out a few years before this, so there's a non-zero chance they took inspiration from one of its plot beats. Anyway, the ship sending the distress call, the Alfred, is all the way over in Jupiter's orbit, attacked by a mysterious foe. The captain decides to use the test of their experimental engine to respond to this distress call. In fairness, with their prototype technology, they would likely be the fastest out there. Though, given they just witnessed the Alfred being ventilated, some additional caution might have been warranted. At any rate, this test of the gravity control drive is undoubtedly the most important part of what was supposed to be their shakedown cruise. The gravity drive will purportedly allow mankind to travel beyond Jupiter, which didn't even make sense in the time this was released, as even back then a few probes had already been successfully sent to Saturn. But setting that aside, it's also kind of a bizarrely incoherent technology. Now I can accept a certain level of pulpy sci-fi ridiculousness. I'm not about to go after the Planet Express ship from Futurama for moving the entire universe around it, although one does wonder what would happen if you set two of them going in opposite directions. But from stem to stern, the technobabble of the gravity drive is kind of a breed apart here. Let's try to map out the major parts of the gravity drive. First, the main reactor. Again, there's no way in hell this thing physically fits in the hull of the ship as animated, but let's set that aside. It's big, so presumably it's also powerful. They never state what kind of reactor it is, even in the technical diagram, but it seems reasonable to assume it's some kind of futuristic fusion reactor. Next, the sails, which slide into place from the yards above. These are presumably what will drive the ship forward during laser sailing and travel with the gravity drive. While it may seem a little silly for these sails to be fully retractable, it does kind of make sense to avoid damage or otherwise control acceleration. Not that they ever do that, mind you, but one could theoretically see it. Now this, this is the Neutron Compression Accelerator. It does this. The movie doesn't elaborate on exactly how accelerating compressed neutrons makes the ship go, but the blue lights of the system connect to the sails, filling them with light. So presumably they do something glowy there? Based on the reporting of the crew, it seems the denser the neutrons are packed in, the faster the ship goes. Which, I guess isn't the worst technobabble line I've ever heard, but still. After the accelerated compressed neutrons saturate the sails, they activate them with a particle energizer, which is not shown on the technical diagram anywhere. This starts some kind of reaction causing the ship to glow blue all over. Daba di, daba dai, indeed. This also makes the sails billow from... something. And the ship begins to accelerate forward. But this is only the first part of how the ship's drive works. This is what the movie gleefully calls high energy sailing. We've not seen the really crazy shit yet. At T-minus 20 minutes to the activation of the gravity drive, they turn on the space matter intakes. This, believe it or not, could be vaguely evoking a theoretical propulsion technology called a hydrogen ramjet. It picks up loose hydrogen floating in space and uses it for fuel. Solid odds, this is what feeds the reactor. Arguably the most believable technology on the ship so far. Which brings us to arguably the least believable piece of technology on the ship, the electromagnetic scraper. Sitting pretty at the prow of the ship, the EM scraper presumably stores electromagnetic energy the ship encounters, emitting yet another kind of blue light. I guess it's taking in an ambient electromagnetic field, or something? The technical diagram refers to it as the electromagnetic wave generator, which seems to imply it's designed to emit rather than absorb, but that may have gotten lost in the production somewhere. I realize we're getting into technological magic territory here, but I like to imagine this still made sense to somebody. The scraper even has some surprising hidden abilities we'll see later, too. And finally, we have this thing. The movie doesn't even name it, but the technical diagram describes it as the Hyper Booster, which is about as goofy a name as you'd expect. 
It's activated when the switch is pulled to enter gravity isolation sailing in earnest. It's funny that after having gone through so many other named systems, they didn't bother mentioning the one that seems to kick off the whole process. As with everything else here, it emits a tremendous 80s light show effect. And then, wham! A tremendous light explodes behind the ship, slowly panning it a few nudges to the left for some reason. After that, the ship seems to be violently propelled forward by a golden explosion of indeterminate origin, surrounding the ship in an amber glow. I think it's fair to ask the nature of this golden energy chasing them. Is it sustained on an ongoing basis from the ship's reactor? Or is it a one-time gravity wave that they are riding from the point of ignition? What happens to things caught in the wake of this wave? There's all the questions in the universe about this technology, and the movie doesn't particularly answer any of them. On a rule of cool basis, though, not gonna lie, it's still a pretty sweet way to do faster than light travel. As ever, though, completely blinding. But oh ho ho, we're not done introducing strange technologies. There's the special ventral sail used for stability and the quote unquote gravity generator. Apparently, they haven't been using the gravity generator to this point, despite now traveling at a non-trivial percentage of light speed. The gravitons from the gravity generator hit the ventral sail and boom, new particle effect unlocked, like looking directly into the sun. We've now shifted from golden to red. Oh, and check this flash animation ass tween here. Ooh, that's bad. Admittedly, you never really see any celestial objects in relation to the ship during this mode of propulsion, but the shredding guitar gently suggests to the viewer that the ship is, in fact, traveling very fast. And that's, well, as much of the ship's propulsion systems as I can decipher. It's a mess, to put it mildly. I realize it's asking far too much to expect coherence from this 80s fever dream, but it really is hilariously incomprehensible. To top it all off, despite the name of the movie being Photon Sailor Starlight and all, the gravity drive system as designed does not seem to actually use photons on any level. I guess it scans better than Neutron Sailor Starlight. Oh, and on the note of gravity, it goes without saying, they never explain why everyone experiences normal gravity on the ship. Maybe they swiped a shipment of Star Trek's gravity plates. So that's the Starlight's engine technology. But what were the crew up to during all this? Well, to start, one of them was still making their way to the ship immediately before the jump. Meet Akira. He washed out of the training program when he punched an instructor in the face but he wanted to be a part of the Starlight's crew so bad that he stole an advanced fighter from his post in lunar orbit and flew to them. He hot dogs it up quite a bit, showing off to his former classmates, but the captain seems A-OK -okay with this and lets him on board for a laugh. He flubs the landing quite a bit, but is still successfully able to enter the Starlight. To the EXO's credit, he orders Akira to stay in the rec room for the duration of the test. But as you might expect, this doesn't hold. The helmsman of the starlight passes out in the middle of the test, and Akira takes his place. In a moment that you would think would call for caution, Akira instead pushes the engines well past the limits of the test, recklessly declaring that, which by all accounts seems to be physically correct, but that's probably not the way he means it. The captain agrees with this statement, seeming to not care about the potential risk to his ship in pushing an untested propulsion system beyond its limits. Charming. So, not the best showing from anyone, really. Pleased with the outcome of the test, the captain gives the crew a speech congratulating them on their achievement. They even elect to make Akira a full member of the crew for his service. After almost a week since the distress call was logged, they finally arrive on the scene. Not exactly the strongest showing that it took them so long to get there, despite having the gravity drive. At any rate, they manage to recover the lone surviving life pod from the wreck. Inside is Sarah Cyanbaker, a high school student on a summer vacation trip to Jupiter. You're probably not meant to think too hard about that one, but it does seem a bit much to go to the edge of explored space for a vacation. They also encounter the entity that destroyed the Alford. It emits a magnetic storm of some kind looking to detect and ensnare them, 
so they wisely cut their power, running silent through the asteroid field. When they finally come face to face with it, they use steam braking to stop the ship. Apparently the thrusters are using literal steam. I can't even process that one. Somehow this doesn't trigger the entity's defenses either. The captain orders three crew members to EVA to the entity to investigate, which by itself isn't the worst idea in the world, but it goes disastrously. One of the expedition team gets their foot caught in some kind of gaping metallic space maw. This scene gave me some real nightmares as a kid. Things go from bad to worse as the trapped crew member yells out for help over their radio, awakening the entity. I'm pretty sure this is the guy who was deputized into being the communications officer too. So much for that vital position. The captain, correctly sensing danger, gives the order to retreat. The entity, having begun to chew through the deployed crew members, unexpectedly and violently explodes. While the movie never specifies exactly why this happens, I suppose it could be some kind of self-destruct triggered by the away team's presence. Though self-destructing seems exceptionally premature given the firepower at this thing's disposal. Regardless, a massive explosion engulfs the screen. This time, grape-flavored. It produces some kind of astral rift, the Stellaris expansion I adamantly refuse to pay full price for. It flings the ship across the solar system to Uranus. Why the self-destructing alien ship caused the starlight to wind up here is anybody's guess, but it's definitely convenient for the next plot beat. They begin repairing the ship with various launch craft which, much like every other piece of technology they use, in no way seem like they would fit inside the hull. While passing by Oberon, one of Uranus's many moons, Sarah psychically senses something under the ice, calling to her. More than just an average high school junior, Sarah is established here to have psychic powers that would later be attributed to her quote-unquote Nordic blood. Little bit of a red flag there, though a profoundly goofy one. Trust me when I say that you will not believe where this particular plotline goes. Anyway, under the ice of Oberon, they find a genuine Roswell-style flying saucer. Okay then. The captain orders Akira to go in solo and take a look. Unlike the ill-fated members of the previous expedition team, Akira enjoys a jaunty stroll down the corridors of the ship, with Sarah guiding him to a strange computer room. The computer room contains a few alien data chips. Not gonna lie, this data storage design slaps. 10 out of 10, no notes. I can only imagine how cool it would feel to slot one of these bad boys in. But maybe I'm just a sucker for crystal-based technology. The crew come to the conclusion that these data sticks are pentagonal data, which I'm not entirely sure if this means the data is in base five, or if the technology itself uses some kind of five state system instead of binary. Whatever the case, 10 seconds of typing later, they begin to receive the decoded data. It consists of some images and a gentle tune. The boson recognizes it as a traditional Norwegian ditty of some kind. They load the next crystal and see runic writing, which Sarah is able to translate somehow. Turns out the aliens that crashed here fled to Earth, presumably to prehistoric Scandinavia. Translating this tale of woe has a deleterious effect on her, but the XO, Mamaru, not that one, bids her to continue, fascinated by the history. But she can bear no more, leading to this truly iconic moment. <gasps> this is the first time Odin is ever mentioned, so on your first viewing experience, it's guaranteed to come out of nowhere. If you watched this mess decades ago, there's a good chance this is the part you remember. Now, completely Odined out, she collapses, mystifying the crew. Further translation of the data reveals an ancient star chart. They use the most inefficient interpolation algorithm ever to pinpoint how old it is. Exactly 20,000 years ago, a comically round number. Did James Nguyen write this? They also decode a map of a nearby region of space where the laws of physics no longer apply. Surprisingly, they're not talking about their own ship. This is apparently a warp point, which they could use to enter hyperspace. 
further complicating their already baffling faster than light options. Finally, they pinpoint where the alien ship came from, the Canopus system, which went supernova 20,000 years ago. They connect this to the Odin legend, which claims that mankind descended from a place called Odin, destroyed by a kingdom of fire. They somehow jump to the conclusion that Odin must be a planet in the Canopus system. In addition to decoding the data from the crashed spaceship, they salvage an alien engine that allegedly triples their power. They don't show this engine, mind you, it's all done completely off-screen. Even the throwaway engineering lines are pure nonsense. Amusingly, this is one of the rare moments the dub actually makes marginally more sense, as in that version, they merely drain the energy reserves of the ship, rather than integrating a completely alien reactor technology. Given the experimental nature of the ship and all, further modifying major parts of it seems like a terrible idea in general. Anyway, after all is said and done, they finish their modifications and repairs. The crew begs the captain to immediately set course for Odin, using the warp point they found. If you've played any Stellaris, you probably know how this kind of reckless abandon can often end for a science ship. The captain, wisely, orders them to stick to the mission and return home, the test of the gravity isolation drive now complete. The Starlight took 20 years to construct, after all. It's a one-of-a-kind ship. It wouldn't make any sense risking the ship and the lives of the crew by leaving immediately relative to, I don't know, returning to dock, resupplying, and potentially leaving later? To say nothing of the seven lives that have already been lost in what was supposed to be only a test of the gravity drive. Yet the crew are aghast, unable to accept the captain's decision. Discontent runs rampant, but Akira takes things to the next level. Sarah also plays a role in convincing the crew to embrace recklessness. The mutineers quickly round up all the officers and lock them in the rec room. They break the door afterwards to detain them. The captain cracks a knowing smile, pleased that they did this, once again showing his profound lack of judgment. It's important to point out here that the Starlight is unarmed. They have no ready-made weapons other than those on the fighter Akira stole. They are, in no uncertain terms, a prototype ship that has narrowly survived a close encounter of the worst kind. While the movie wants you to identify with their youthful, adventurous spirit, if you stop and think about what they're actually doing for even a second, you can see how absurd this all is. They set course for Canopus, firing up the gravity isolation drive and traveling through the nearby hyperspace point. Traveling in hyperspace causes St. Elmo's fire to break out all over the ship. If you're not familiar, St. Elmo's Fire is an actual electrical weather phenomenon where certain objects glow due to an electrically charged atmosphere. They say it's happening due to material being drawn into the warp hole. I'm not an expert on the dynamics of electromagnetism in space, but it does seem a bit rich. Setting that aside, it is admittedly a cool effect. Anyway, they make their way through the warp, violently tossing around the officers still locked up in the rec room. They exit 32 light years away in a system with three planets. Presumably, these smaller celestial objects are just moons, I guess. There aren't that many star systems that this could be on the way to Canopus, so you would think that they would name the system, but nah. It's also full of nebula clouds. They gasp at the striking stellar scenery. Before they can get too comfortable, they encounter Asgard. Unfortunately, not those Asgard. This Asgard is some kind of hostile alien intelligence. He roasts the crew of the Starlight mercilessly. Before launching an attack on them, despite his floaty space god-like appearance, the forces at his command seem to be fairly conventional drone fighters, controlled by an extremely cool control unit. The Starlight and its crew immediately begin getting their asses kicked, having no real means to defend themselves. 
Though Akira hotwires a comm laser in the crow's nest into a laser cannon by setting it to max output. Okay, sure, why not? I've heard worse techno babble in this movie already. I'll give it to him. He narrowly saves the bridge from being rammed by an enemy fighter. They attempt to flee using the gravity drive, but it's already taken too much damage. Akira and Ryu, the other pilot, deploy in two search launches to buy them time. Notably, they have to quickly modify the cutting lasers on their search launches into offensive weapons. They then open fire. Not quite properly lined up with their emitters. Oops. It's also strange that Akira isn't using the super cool prototype fighter he previously absconded with. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use one of these ostensibly non-combat craft. Despite Akira and Ryu cutting a path through the enemy fighters, the Starlight takes yet more grievous damage. While all of this is going on, the officers finally get their door open, and they escape the confines of the rec room. They make their way to the bridge and issue the crew an emergency performance review. <laughs> He's not wrong. It then comes out that they can't use high-energy sailing to escape the area because the running rigging is down, preventing them from controlling the sails. Here's where things get breathtakingly stupid. The bosun orders the crew topside to fix the riggings in the middle of the battle. They have all of a single turret covering them. It is also in these exterior shots that the inconsistent dimensions of the ship become impossible to ignore. Even as a child, I noticed this. Meanwhile, the captain has an idea. Do you remember the electromagnetic scraper? The fantastical device that scrapes electromagnetic fields in front of the ship or whatever? Well, with 10 seconds of reprogramming, it can do this. This is beyond farcical. This is the kind of made-up ability that a grade schooler would disagree with for being too OP. It seems to be some kind of directed energy blast powered by stored electromagnetic fields. The blast gratuitously annihilates the enemy fighters in front of the starlight. Akira lands a crushing blow, destroying a fighter control ship, causing many enemy fighters to violently crash into each other. Yet the enemy fighters are still able to launch a devastating attack, killing multiple crew members on the deck and injuring the bosun. A repair job inside the ship goes bad too, and the chief engineer is put out of commission in the resulting arc flash. But because the plot says it's time to move on, the repairs are completed anyway, and they activate the gravity isolation drive, traveling further in the direction of Canopus. Now, the movie doesn't linger on this, but it's worth pointing out, after everything that's happened, they presumably still had the option to set course for home. They just fought a space god named after a Norse mythological figure. More crew members are dead, and multiple officers are injured. This voyage of theirs is not going great. One would think the captain, now having taken command of the ship again, would quite literally turn the ship around and go home, but he does not. I guess he just didn't want to kill the vibe. After escaping the forces of Asgard, the Starlight finds itself in the Ganunga Gap. Researching the name, I found out that this is, in fact, another term from Norse mythology. Some kind of primordial dimension of creation. Like most things in this movie, it's very bright. They appear trapped in this pocket of space, as even though their engines work, they say they are not moving. Despite the background animation very clearly implying they are moving in multiple scenes, they see scores of wrecked starships, implying a dire fate for them if they can't escape. Akira takes this time to apologize to the captain for the whole launching a mutiny and getting multiple people killed thing, but the captain just brushes him off. I like this phrase and all, but Akira here probably should be thrown in the brig. He also tries to apologize to the bosun, but because Akira is the closest thing this work has to a main character, the bosun brushes him off as well. He also prevails upon Akira to get the starlight to her destination safely. Him, too, apparently succumbing to whatever gas leak is making people want to continue this voyage. Once again, the Starlight undergoes repairs. Seems odd that the smaller craft can apparently move around just fine even if the Starlight can't, but then again, when has this movie ever been particularly consistent? 
During these repairs, they uncover a crashed enemy fighter and bring it on board, its ass now belonging to them. They open the cockpit. Much to the crew's surprise, the fighter has a full-on robot pilot. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense as the fighters were previously established to be controlled by the network hub ships, but I get what they're going for. I'd also be remiss if I didn't highlight the most hilarious difference between the sub and the dub here. Compare these reactions. Jeez! Yeah, if you watch my future videos, don't be surprised to see this one crop up again. Jeez. Much like the Odinian computer they encountered on Oberon, this robot is also full of yummy RAM chips. Though this time, their super space computer can't read them for some reason. They express concern that these robots might be all that remains of Odin's civilization. They describe the concept of a planet of robots as nuts. This almost feels like a joking reference to another Toei animation feature, 1979's Galaxy Express 999, which you might not want to invite that comparison, Odin. Bummed out at the prospect of Odin being a machine empire, the captain gives them a stirring speech, inspiring them to stick to their guns and complete the voyage, despite its intense stupidity. Speaking of guns, they install some that fit neatly on the top side of the ship. They never specify if they're getting these from the local wrecks, but that's the only thing that even remotely makes sense. Although, with everything else fitting impossibly into the hull, it wouldn't surprise me if they had been storing these on the ship the whole time too. Akira does his own retrofitting, working on the fighter he should have used in the previous engagement. Bizarrely, the bosun, who should be recovering in the med bay, joins him. He implores Akira to drink rum with him, which given his injuries and likely high painkiller dosage and all, he should not be indulging to begin with. Even Akira tells him not to. The bosun tells him to loosen up and join him, which after more prodding he finally does, coughing a bit from the rum. Then, despite the joyous music playing throughout the scene, the bosun keels over, dead. Great, thanks for that, man. Definitely a necessary development for him to die like this, leaving the very inexperienced crew without his guidance. More cynically, given the overall trajectory of the voyage so far, maybe he considered this the easy way out. Either way, it's a hilariously out of place scene that feels utterly needless. Speaking of scenes that come from nowhere, later on, Sarah mentions to Akira that she's getting her memories back of what happened after the attack on the Alfred. She proudly proclaims that she's not just Sarah Cyanbaker, she's actually Sarah Cyanbaker of Odin, and that she's going home now. The movie does not explain what, if anything, she means by this. Suddenly, everybody's least favorite mission from Homeworld begins, and they find themselves staring down a swarm of asteroids. Akira blasts a big one with the new Cascade Cannon. Destroying this asteroid somehow provides the ship with enough energy to fire up the gravity drive again, because even minor engineering plot points are apparently not allowed to make sense. So they engage the gravity isolation drive, once again reusing the earlier footage. It is especially jarring this time because the surrounding space looks nothing like the asteroid swarm they were clearly just in. Sarah chimes in with the advice to head left to escape the gap. This whole thing being nautical themed and all, you think she would have said port or something. Not to mention the definition of left while traveling at any meaningful percentage of relativistic speed changes quite rapidly. Regardless, the crew is able to interpret this and note that there's warp points that they can use in that direction. They fall into one and emerge in some kind of nebula. They then run the gravity drive footage again for good measure, because why not? Once again, they emerge into normal space. 120 light years from Earth, with 60 light years to go, almost to Canopus, they say. Canopus is actually 310 light years from Earth, but I'll give them a pass on that one as it's probably the most inconsequential nitpick possible, given everything else. Then, at the risk of making too many Stellaris jokes, they encounter the enigmatic fortress, Space Fortress Belgel. Their clash with Asgard awoke it, and now it's on the way to destroy Earth. Of course, in Stellaris, this would almost certainly be instant death, for them and humanity, but here they have ironclad plot armor, or schooner plot armor in their case. 
Not even considering retreat, they fly headlong into battle, making full use of their new weaponry. But wait, what's this? Yet another new weapon system to unveil in the middle of a battle? Yep, this time it's the MASH missile. It sends debris hurtling out of the ship, evoking a full broadside from a man of war. Amusingly, the debris homes in on the enemies somehow. I suppose they had to add this effect to make it even remotely effective, but it still looks rather silly. Despite all the new toys, the Starlight continues to get its ass handed to it. The captain is violently knocked from his post on the battle bridge. The music swells melodramatically. As things seem to be going rather poorly, what will our heroes do? Which of these advanced tactics do you think will win the day? If you picked blow up a random asteroid with the EM scraper, you are correct. Truly, no enemy can stand against the singularity of incoherence. The asteroid shatters in all directions, completely wrecking the smaller platforms of the fortress, and apparently all their fighters, too. The captain orders Akira and most of the crew to fly through this frightful green maelstrom to the core of the fortress to take it out from the inside. Fortunately, Akira actually remembers to use his advanced fighter this time. The others join him in search launches and the sizable landing craft. They fly through a hole in the side of the fortress and navigate through a slew of tight spaces, doors conveniently open for them. Not the greatest security here in Belgel. They find themselves flying through quite a lot of 80s technochrome album covers. The landing craft touches down on a random landing pad. It then launches a slew of smaller craft? Well, it doesn't make a lick of sense from a fleet doctrine perspective, but it does make sense in terms of 80s toy sales. Just look at all these different kinds of craft, all of which would likely have their own unique sets of parts to maintain. Even the two search launches don't appear to be quite the same model. Can you imagine how many different sets of spare parts they would have to keep on board the Starlight? Though, I suppose with the Starlight's infinite hull capacity, that wouldn't present too much of a storage problem. Still a maintenance nightmare, though, I'm sure. It's at this point I think I'm obligated to mention that this came out two years after Return of the Jedi. Can't help but think they took inspiration again. Akira lands a wrecking shot with what looks like his only missile, shutting down the factory block. They keep moving and spot a large control tower, so they take the most logical course of action getting out and attacking on foot. Yes, I'm serious. Akira claims that fighters can't make it, but it looks like there's plenty of space for fighters? Never mind their smaller personal use craft. Regardless, they rush the control tower. This proves to be exactly as bad an idea as it seems. A colossal walking tank pops out of the floor of the structure, as well as a slew of battle droids. Now you might ask yourself, what are our heroes armed with? Up until this point, we've seen no use of personal weapons, only craft weapons. Well, would it surprise you to find out that their primary armaments for this trip are honest-to-god pew-pew laser pistols? These prove woefully unfit for the frontal assault role, but they did manage to bring one other weapon, a space laser bazooka which needs to be plugged in to fire. This seems like it would severely limit its mobility, to put it mildly. Either way, Ryu fires it, scoring a direct hit, amusingly knocking himself backwards as he fires it, too. Either he's not using it right, or it has no recoil protection. Come to think of it, though, should a laser bazooka even have recoil? Admittedly, I'm probably putting more thought into this than the creators did. Anyway, the walking tank is destroyed, and they ascend the control tower. Yes, you are seeing that right. They brought Sarah. Sarah, the high school junior. On this mission to destroy this heavily defended space fortress from the inside. They didn't even bother coming up with a justification for this. She's just there because the plot needs her to be. They blast the enemies in the control tower. More explosions ensue, knocking one of the more advanced robots down from an upper level. Its faceplate shatters, revealing what looks like a human underneath. Sarah has a pronounced, if delayed, reaction.
It's almost as if she was a real actress in a bad movie waiting for a cue. To the horror of the Away Party, they have been fighting cyborgs, not just robotic drones. The dying fellow bids Sarah come closer, mumbling Odin over and over, definitely speaking her language. He also hands over one of those memory sticks. The Away Party slots it into a local computer and begins reading it. Good thing the advanced alien civilization doesn't require two-factor authentication. This bathes the entire scene in an unearthly green light. The music rises, desperately trying to convince you this is the most important reveal in the movie. This device is some kind of hollow projector, displaying Planet Odin. The pale guy rejoices in finally being able to see Odin again. Images of Odin's lush paradise continue to be shown ad nauseum. The overall message of the scene firmly established as Odin was a cool place to be. Oh, and they show Yggdrasil, though I'm not 100% sure if it's metaphorical or literally the tree in space. Sarah rudely interrupts the dying cyborg's words by saying she was born in the old times and raised by the giants, which still makes absolutely no sense as she is most definitely still a high school junior from Earth. If we want to be charitable, she could have inherited space memories of some kind from some alien force while she was in the pod, but even setting that aside, this still reads as the dumbest interplanetary cultural appropriation ever. The cyborg asks Sarah her name. Upon hearing her name is Sarah, he reveals that this was the name of the Queen of Odin. So congratulations, Sarahs of the world, you are all secretly space queens. Funnily enough, even in this bizarre Norse-inspired universe, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense as Sarah is decidedly not a particularly Norwegian name. It appears to be of Hebrew origin. It does seem to originate from the words for chief or ruler though, so I'll give them a little credit. Anyway, the guy also reveals that the fortress they're in was once a space colony created by the survivors of Odin. They accidentally created an artificial intelligence, one thing led to another, and it enslaved them. Tale as old as time, really. As is often the case, it wants to determinedly exterminate all life in the universe. Though the guy reveals there may still be some non-cyborged Odinians still on Odin, despite it previously being roasted by the supernova? As with most things in this movie, you probably don't want to think too hard about that one. His exposition dump cycle now complete, the cyborg passes away. The team once again resolves to complete the voyage to Odin after they finish the fight here. They return to their strangely proportioned vehicles and begin flying to the center of the fortress. The core in sight, they once again get out and walk. Gotta get those 10,000 steps in somehow, I guess. They attack the core, but to their horror, it merely shrugs off the space bazooka shots. The fortress's artificial intelligence, Belgale itself, mocks them. The computer has a point, this whole thing has been pretty nonsensical. Belgale's design is quite visually striking, though his menace is somewhat undercut by his goofy voice and very unrobotic laugh. <laughs> Sarah has had enough of Belgil's smug pontificating and charges in, yelling her famous battle cry. Belgil strikes back at her with turrets. Notably, the compositors didn't even bother trying to match up the emission point and the effect again. With these deadly beams dazing her slightly, Akira takes the wheel. As ever, more robots spawn in to fight the landing party. Note the bad edit here. They all run back to the protective cover of the main landing craft and quickly come up with a surefire way to take down Belgil, activate his self-destruct system. A massive assumption on their part that the AI hadn't removed it eons ago, but I suppose they do have recent evidence that Odinian technology still self-destructs quite spectacularly. A few crew members take off, flying to Belgil's core conclusively proving that getting out of their vehicles was always a terrible idea. Those still on the ground continue to fight the hordes of robots. Insert Helldivers 2 joke here. Akira flies close to Belgale and discovers a robot control module is on his head. How he knows specifically that green bit there is the robot control module is beyond me, but I suppose that's more threat of causality than the movie usually gives. He fires the missile silencing Belgel's robot armies. 
The impossibly advanced alien intelligence probably should have invested in a spare Wi-Fi router. Meanwhile, Nakoda and Mamoru, not that one, infiltrate Belgel's core, countless random explosions nipping at their heels. His mechanical army now stopped cold in their tracks, Belgel attempts to solve his intruder problem by turning up the temperature in the fortress. Apparently, the fortress has a very extensive furnace complex. Go figure. Belgel proudly states that they will be incinerated in a whopping 30 minutes. Not exactly the strongest plan B. Nakoda and Mamoru make their way to Belgel's core. Would it surprise you to learn it's blindingly bright? This time with a nice emerald green flavor. They ponder how to input the self-destruct command for a time, but then Nakoda gingerly reveals the movie's final technological ass pole. It's a big one. In his spare time, he created a single-use pentadigital grenade capable of interfacing with Odinian computers. Handy, that. All they need to do is fire it at the brain, and it will input the self-destruct command, which they somehow know will turn the fortress into a black hole. However, they need to disable the shield protecting the brain first. Against all odds, Mamoru spots one particular laser entering the brain and immediately concludes it controls the brain's shield. The plot needs him to be correct, so he is. He begins moving control crystals around, apparently knowing exactly what he has to do on this one-of-a-kind alien space fortress computer. The shield drops, and Nakoda fires the hack grenade. Despite it being a tool of computer programming, it also emits a blinding light on contact. Would sure suck if USB drives did this. After Nakoda and Mamoru are rescued by Akira and Ryu, the landing party makes their escape. Belgel crumbles, unable to deal with the indignity of being defeated by Squishies. The crew quickly return to the Starlight, which apparently faced no threats whatsoever while they were on their adventure in the fortress. Maybe the away mission follows Railjack rules. They charge the engine and come about, preparing to make their escape. Belgel unleashes one final goofy death rattle <laughs> as the space fortress is consumed by fire, collapsing into a black hole. Upon Belgel's demise, the captain cracks a smile and begins dying. The medical officer, who presumably could have been treating him while the adventure on the fortress was going on, stands by and watches. Between the boson and this, I guess the Hippocratic Oath is more of a suggestion in this universe. Maybe the medical officer owed them both money. Regardless, the captain delivers a rather lengthy speech, reminding the crew of their noble duty to explore new worlds, and praising the magnificent job they have done so far. He formally turns the ship over and implores them to complete the mission. The captain then dramatically passes away, with the medical officer making the sign of the cross, the sum total of his contribution to this moment. The crew are heartbroken, but they fire up their reused footage drive, using whatever they can get their hands on in a desperate attempt to finish out the movie coherently. Sarah gleefully remarks about how excited she is to return home to Odin, despite having never been there in the first place. She sheds a tear for the Fallen as she and Akira exchange the final unearned melodramatic lines in the movie. And that's it. Yes, I'm serious. Despite everything, they never actually get to Odin. Itchy and Scratchy never make it to the fireworks factory. You see, this was supposed to be the first in a trilogy of movies. Which, given everything I've shown you, I think you can see why Odin did not receive any follow-ups. So it ends here barely a complete story on its own, despite its exceptionally bloated 2-hour, 19-minute runtime. The bizarre death of the captain was presumably to let the crew call the shots in the sequels. Needless to say, Sarah never got to see Odin, and will likely never know what her deal was. The credits roll with one final performance from Loudness, the band that provided much of the movie's soundtrack, titled Searching for Odin, My Love. So what the hell happened here? Unlike Odin, I'd love to tell you the full story, but I'm no Kenny Lauderdale. This might surprise you, but as best as I can tell, there's not a whole lot out there to work with on this nearly 40-year-old anime flop. 
on the English-speaking part of the internet, anyway. I can tell you the story writer of Odin is credited as a creator of the Space Battleship Yamato series, which makes a lot of sense. He definitely kept it in the naval tradition, to put it mildly. But yeah, a lot of the writing issues could probably be laid at his feet. I'd also be curious about what would lead a venerable studio like Toei Animation to put out something like this. There has to be a story here, I just know it. Yet despite everything I've said, all the tremendous, glaring, blinding even, flaws of this goofy anime movie, I still kind of love it. Don't get me wrong, it's dumb as hell. Like, I'm not an animeologist, but I'm positive you'd have to work very hard to find something of comparable budget dumber than this. And if you're interested in experiencing it yourself, I have good news for you. As of recording, the whole thing is still on YouTube, the dub and the sub. Hilariously, the dub is almost an entire hour shorter. That has to be some kind of record. If you listen carefully, you can even hear where they violently cut without re-timing the music. What do you say, sir? It's worth trying, Skipper. And we got nothing to lose. Countdown starting at 10. Accelerator activation point 448. Despite the sub's gargantuan length and glacial pacing, I would still recommend it over the dub. The dub misses quite a few plot points, and in terms of the voiceover, well, it isn't the worst dub I've ever heard, but it's close. God protect you, Ishige. Thanks. Goodbye. With all that said, that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you for joining me on this fantastical voyage. May we all fare better in our lives' journeys than the ill-fated crew of the Starlight.